Good afternoon. I'm Larry Rogers. I'm Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at Oregon State. And I am so pleased uh, that we're hosting Andrew Nathan, class of 1919, professor of political science at Columbia University. Actually, we were just visiting a little bit before this right now. And uh, Professor Nathan has been there since 1971. So he's celebrating his 50th year at, uh, at Columbia University. I mean, what, a, what an amazing uh, uh, career span that represents. He'll speak, be speaking today on a very timely topic uh, entitled China's Strategic Vision, Implications for the US and Taiwan. You know, I have to say, I think it's an especially important time right now for universities to be giving a voice to our nation's experts on key topics in the news. We've seen lots and lots of opining and politicking and, and thinking through things in fairly superficial levels over the past couple of years around what all of us believe to be very sensitive issues. And sometimes while they're talked about with great care, sometimes we all know in various media outlets, they get presented devoid of facts, devoid of expertise. And so it's this kind of event that allows us to bring a distinguished expert into a sensitive, important national conversation and give us a grounding in what those of us who care about such matters should be thinking about. Uh, so, so even during COVID, these kinds of events, I think have, have been especially important to keep us grounded in the kind of, uh, of academic veracity and sort of search for the, the right way to be thinking about these issues. Uh, Professor Nathan's teaching and research interests includes Chinese politics and foreign policy, the comparative study of political participation and political culture, and human rights. He's been involved in, obviously, over half a century, a range of activities at Columbia over the years, including a stint as department chair. Uh, but he's also a regular interview subject on, on China topics, uh, frequently in the news, and he's a book reviewer uh, for Asian topics for various venues like Foreign Affairs Magazine, uh, a member of the editorial board of Journal of Contemporary China, China Information, and others. And I would say that I think over the years he's written too many books for me even to name here, um, that he's, he's been a steady kind of contributor to edited collections, to monographs in a way that's put him very much at the forefront of all conversations around, uh, around China. Uh, he uh, has also had articles appear in places like World Politics, Daedalus, The China Quarterly, Journal of Democracy, Asian Survey, The New Republic. What I'm trying to illustrate is the fact that he's been in the middle of all of these important conversations for decades and decades. I think it's really exciting for him to be here too. Uh, Hung Yak uh, Ip is going to speak in a moment as will uh, Professor of Political Science, Associate Professor of Political Science, Yu Li, and he's a past professor of hers. And so I think there's a real excitement from a kind of personal point of view to have him here. So I wanna thank the two of them for working to put this, uh, put this program together. And I want to say that financial support for this event has been provided by the Chun and Jane Chu Family Foundation. I think it's a real privilege during COVID to have these kinds of opportunities. We'd of course rather be hosting a Professor Nathan on campus. We can't do that. We hope to get back to that point fairly soon. But in the absence of that, these kinds of events have given us often opportunities to have people in our Zoom rooms with us in ways that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to benefit from, from having people here or having you be able to benefit from them. So without further ado, let me say, Welcome to, uh, to Professor Nathan. Let me turn it over now to uh, history associate professor Hung Yak Ip, and I'm going to let her take it from him, uh, take it from here. And thank you for attending, and we're really excited that this is going on. Thank you, Larry. Um, I'm honored to be given this opportunity. I'm honored to be given this opportunity to introduce Professor Andrew Nathan the class of 1919 professor of political science at Columbia University. Professor Nathan is one of the most prominent experts on contemporary China. When I was in graduate school, which was a long time ago, one of the first books I read was authored by him. Entitled Chinese Democracy, the book examines how the interaction between Chinese dispositions and modern Western culture led to a Chinese version of democracy. 
it analyzes the Chinese perspective on the individual, the uneasy relationships between democracy and nationalism, and also China's focus on harmony. His insight laid the foundation for research on Chinese political thought in the decades to come. I especially recall uh, in recent years, Professor Nathan took part in discussion on current development in China. I especially recall his critical reflections on Confucianism, meritocracy, and political leadership. And he has also published on a wide range of topics, including foreign relations and human rights. He shares his knowledge about China in media a lot. Therefore, Professor Nathan is virtually a perfect speaker to deliver a lecture on China's strategic vision, the US and Taiwan. So now my colleague from political science, Professor Hua Yu Li will introduce Professor Nathan, her major professor at Columbia. Hua Yu. Um, let me just offer um, a brief introduction uh, for our sp speaker, Professor Nathan. He's one of the world's most prominent China scholar. Um, and um, he specializes in Chinese politics, foreign policy, human rights, and the political culture. And he has made his imprint in all these areas of study. His lecture today, based on his decades long study of China, deals with an extremely important and timely subject, the rise of an increasingly assertive China and its implications for the world. Uh, I want to end my brief introduction uh, on a personal note. I was Professor Nason's student long time ago. And I have been very fortunate to have him as my teacher and mentor. He has helped me to going through all the hurdles of being a graduate student. And, and actually, even uh, when I submitted my first prospect uh, for my book, Professor Andrew Nason actually commented on that and revised that for me before I submitted that prospect to the publisher. So um, I have been very fortunate to have him as my teacher and mentor. He has inspired me and all his students to be good scholars and good teachers. So on that note, now Andy, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Those are such lovely introductions. I feel a little intimidated by them. It's, it's true, I've been at Columbia for 50 years, but as you will know, you professors who introduced me that being on a campus and teaching students keeps you young. I often like to joke that after having been there 50 years, it's about time for me to clean my office. But uh, uh, for this whole year, I haven't been on campus because of COVID. And for that reason, I can't join you either at OSU. I wish that I could. Thank you to Dean Rogers and Professor Yip and Professor Lee for the introduction and to the Chun and Jane Cho Family Foundation for sponsoring this lecture and for the various, for the hosting units within the university that are involved in sponsoring it. Well, as Dean Rogers said, the rise of China has brought China into the center and forefront of American foreign policy. And now when you read the various foreign policy journals, for example, Foreign Affairs, where I do a book review section in every issue, uh, almost every article whether it deals with China, whether it's about China, whether it's about Europe, Africa, whether it's about global public health, whether arms control, whether North Korea, whether it's technological competition, China is all over the place in American foreign policy. And many people have 
made a statement that's become a cliche that the issue of US China relations is going to be the defining issue for war and peace, stability and instability in the 21st century. And as I'll come to later in the talk, Taiwan is in the center of this huge issue. It isn't the only part of it, but I think experts would say it is the most dangerous out of all of the many difficult subjects that are that are the center of friction and, and, and conflict and competition within the US-China relations. The attitude of the United States toward China changed in a dramatic way during the previous administration, the Trump administration. The Trump administration defined the US-China relationship in a number of different ways because the Trump administration China policy was not really tightly coordinated. The Trump administration had various different policymakers who were making their own China policies and trying to push their own China policies. The president himself was predominantly interested in the trade deficit and tried to fix it with a trade war with putting tariffs on Chinese imports. The Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and the Vice President Mike Pence were concerned that China would represent a threat to Western civilization and to American cultural ideals. And they wanted, Pence was not as clear about it, but Pompeo toward the end of the Trump administration gave a speech in which he said that the core of American policy should be to help the Chinese people overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. There were other members of the Trump administration with other priorities, some of them having to do with intelligence, with, with, with uh, Chinese stealing uh, of, of Western technology, some of it being military and so forth. So there wasn't, but there wasn't a, a clear common policy, but the general policy was antagonistic and built around the idea of a China threat. And I think the document that the Trump administration put out that most accurately reflected the sort of center of what they were doing was a national security statement that described the US-China relationship as strategic competition. This concept of strategic competition crystallized a change that had been taking shape for a while. So as when, from the time that President Nixon visited China in 1972 up through the Bill Clinton administration, the central theme of US-China policy was something called engagement. And engagement was the idea that if we trade with China, if we have educational exchange with China, if we uh, uh, open up international institutions to the participation of China, that China will become what one policymaker labeled a responsible stakeholder. It'll be basically a status quo power and basically friendly to the United States. Some rhetoric of engagement even went so far as to suggest that China would become a liberal democracy, but that wasn't really the core of it. The core of engagement was to let China be sufficiently satisfied with its place in the international system so that it would not be a disruptive power. But as, as China began to get much, much richer, st starting with the reforms after the death of Mao, but accelerating in the 1990s, from the, from the early 1990s until uh, the, the uh, first decade of the 21st century, the Chinese economy grew in double digits every year and China became much more wealthy to the point where it is now the number two economic power as measured by gross domestic product in the world after the United States. And if things continue as they are, which of course you never know, but if China continues a rapid pace of growth, the growth has gone down. It's not double digits anymore, and it had a dip in the COVID, but it's come back. If China basically continues a very healthy rate of growth and the United States continues 
a relatively slower rate of growth. China will become the number one economy in the world before too long. Nobody quite knows when, but perhaps even in this decade, certainly in the next decade, unless you know some kind of disaster strikes China. So as the Chinese economy started this very, very rapid growth, China began to build up, invest in its military and build up what is now the largest Navy in the world. And the American administration under Obama began to worry about this Chinese challenge. And some of you may remember that Obama announced something called a pivot to Asia, which was an idea that, that the, US, the, the investment in US military and diplomatic activity needed to pay more attention to Asia because of the challenge of a rising China. But this was a fairly weak response, a tentative and provisional sort of first step in redefining the US-China relationship. So it was under the Trump administration that they sort of crystallized this notion that it's a strategic competition or worse, but that was the phrase they used that I think kind of stuck. Thinking about it in retrospect, for many years I taught Chinese foreign policy. I don't teach it currently. We have another professor who's teaching it. Uh, probably Professor Lee may have taken that course when I was teaching, I don't remember. But um, from the perspective of my teaching of Chinese foreign policy, which I like to teach from the Chinese point of view, in other words, what's driving them, how do they see the world, what is motivating Chinese foreign policy, the fact that as China got wealthier, it began to challenge the American position as the number one power in the world and the num particularly the number one military power in the Asia Pacific region, that was understandable. It was, I would say it was inevitable. I won't claim that I predicted it, but I will say that in retrospect, one can understand why this is. And the reason is that although we think of China as a behemoth, as this vast, aggressive, powerful country, if you're making foreign policy within China, if you're one of the policymakers in Beijing, you don't think of your position as being quite so advantageous. You're sitting in Beijing, you're trying to govern this huge country, which has undergone very radical change as it has gone more wealthy. People move to the cities, they get interested in various religions, they travel around the world, they get the internet, more and more of them go to university. They are no longer believe in any simple form of communism, which the regime tries to propagate. The country also has some very important large mi ethnic minority populations like the Tibetans and the Uyghurs who are not really happy with Chinese rule. It also didn't control until just very recently Hong Kong, which was part of China, but which had its own independent political system that was very westernized and liberal. And it didn't control and doesn't control Taiwan, which from a Beijing point of view is an essential interest of China for its security. And further, China is surrounded by many other powers, just to mention the biggest ones, by Russia, by Japan, by Vietnam, by India, and a lot of others, none of which is really friendly to China in the way that say Canada or Britain or Germany or France or Mexico is friendly to the United States because all these other countries around China have their own cultures and are suspicious of China and have historically had wars and, and territorial disputes with China. And when China looks at this whole security position, it sees that the number one threat is the United States, in fact, because the United States traditionally, and I meaning after World War II, has had the biggest Navy surrounding the China coast, has had military alliances with China's neighbors, Japan, South Korea, with American troops, 30,000 or so troops based in each of those places, has huge military bases near China in Okinawa, in Guam, 
et cetera. So the Chinese feel that the United States is surrounding China and has, is, they don't think the United States wants to invade China, but they do think that the United States has, has and maintains the capability to prevent, to threaten China if it wants to do so. So the Chinese naturally wanna push back this American uh, cordon, if you will, weaken the American position in the West, in East Asia, or what we call the Western Pacific, to have more control over their own security. So it seems to me that as China got richer and was able to invest more in its military and more in its diplomatic posture around the world, the fact that it would want to threaten the inherited or incumbent, if you will, American position of dominance was inevitable. The question though is, that's now the, the, the situation. So the Trump administration called it a strategic competition. The American academic community that I'm a part of agrees with that. The think tanks agree with that. The media agree with that. Public opinion agrees with that central concept that China presents a strategic threat or competition to the interests of the United States. I'm gonna say later, there's still some debates about how to deal with this, but, but that is a, as strong of a consensus as you get in American foreign policy. There's always people with other ideas, but this is a pretty strong central concept. Question is what to do about that. Uh, um, I, I should backtrack for a moment. I forgot to say something important. The current president of China, he's the president, he is also the, the, the general secretary, which means the chairman of the ruling Chinese Communist Party. And he is in effect, the commander in chief of the military. They call it the chairman of the Central Military Commission is this gentleman named Xi Jinping, right? X-I Jinping. He's a tough guy. He's a strong man leader, both domestically and internationally. So, and he came to power in 2012. And it was, and when he came to power, he unfolded pretty quickly a much more assertive form of Chinese foreign policy, including um, more exercises in the, around Taiwan, building up Chinese naval power in the South China Sea and building seven fortified sand islands in the South China Sea, more active threats to the Japanese claim over certain islands that are contested between China and Japan and a very important big project called the Belt and Road Initiative, which in which China is building infrastructure in probably about 80 countries around the world with investments that are estimated to be worth about $1 trillion. So China is expanding its international footprint and doing other things that I can, I can talk about later. The point is that the emergence of Xi Jinping helped to crystallize this American sense of a threat from China. What to do about it? So as I said, the Trump administration was kind of divided. Trump went for the, for the, the trade war. Uh, his trade advisor, Peter Navarro, was interested in decoupling the, the two economies. In other words, not importing stuff from China, but making stuff at home. Trump put some uh, ban upon the, the big Chinese uh, 5G network builder called Huawei. Um, and and um, it was a kind of divided, uh, you know, scattered kind of policy that I think didn't really achieve much in the way of, of, um, uh, of, of confronting the, the competition with China. Now we have the Biden administration and the Biden administration China policy has some elements of continuity with the Trump policy, but I'm gonna argue that when you look sort of under the hood, it's quite different. The elements of continuity with the Trump foreign policy, Biden has kept Trump's tariffs on Chinese imports. He hasn't gotten rid of those tariffs. Uh, he has maintained what 
something that the Trump administration brought in, which was an, a somewhat enhanced protocol position for Taiwan. Uh, this is kind of complicated, but the United States has a very, very friendly relationship with Taiwan, but it doesn't have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. We don't have an, an, an ambassador. We have a person in Taiwan who performs the function of ambassador, but is not ranked as, uh, as a normal ambassador in, in a normal uh, embassy. Uh, so the US has it kind of both ways, but part of the deal that led to this unique relationship of the United States with Taiwan was that there wouldn't be official government to government relations between Taiwan and the United States, but some administrations, when they wanna put pressure on mainland China, they would give the, the Taiwanese representatives the better treatment or send higher ranking persons from the United States to Taiwan. Biden has, the Trump administration did that and Biden has continued that policy. The Trump administration tried to develop a cooperative relationship with three other countries, Japan, Australia, and India, adding the United States. This was called the Quad. And the Biden administration has continued the Quad with an idea that we're cooperating with these other countries to somehow send a signal, you know, not to attack China or uh, sink Chinese boats or anything like that, but to send a signal to China that we're all agreed that China should not be aggressive toward us. And if they were, we would find some way to cooperate. Uh, um, the Biden administration um, has um, continued uh, a policy of more active patrols in the South China Sea that the Trump administration started. So these are all pieces so you could say from that point of view that the Biden administration has just continued on the policy of strategic competition. But actually the policy is different in some important ways. And the main difference is, the, the overarching difference is that the Biden-China policy is, uh, is strategic. Trump called it strategic competition, but didn't have a strategy. He had these different pieces that didn't add up. The Biden administration does have a strategy uh, and it has coordinated policy. So Biden has appointed in his administration a lot of official, he himself has a great deal of expertise on China. He, as vice president, he met many times with Xi Jinping and then when he served in the Senate, he was in foreign relations. He has a good understanding of China um, but in addition to that, he's appointed a lot of old uh, um, experienced China experts in his administration in different departments, in the Defense Department, the State Department, in the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, and so on, and in the National Security Council. There are a number of really good China specialists there. But on top of this whole sort of China interagency is a guy named Kurt Campbell who uh, served under, in the Clinton administration, served Hillary Clinton as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia. So Kurt Campbell has been working on the China portfolio and how that involves Vietnam and Japan and Taiwan and all these other parts for a long, long time. And he's now the so-called Asia czar of Biden's uh, administration. So Campbell ha has ideas about Asia. They're not, you know, Biden and Campbell together have ideas about, about how to do China policy and uh, it will be coordinated. What are the elements that we see em have emerged already from the very beginning and which uh, and which were discussed before Biden came in, you know, because I've participated in a number of sort of policy think tank efforts, Brookings Institution, the, uh, the Asia Society, and Kurt Campbell and others have been in some of these meetings. So we already knew before Biden came in what the policy is going to be. And since he came in in the first hundred days, we can see that policy coming. There are five elements of it that I would like to describe. 
The first one is to really place competition in the center of the relationship. In other words, China policy begins at home. This has become a cliche if you read any of the, you know, as I was saying before, the many, many articles that are written by, you know, policy intellectuals about China. I mean, 80% of them will come with a concluding paragraph that China policy begins at home because it is a competition. And if you're going to compete, you, we need a good economy. We need to be keeping ahead in the race for technological innovation. We need to be conveying to the rest of the world a positive image of our political system and our value system. Biden said a couple of weeks ago, if we want to win the strategic competition with China, we have to show that democracy works better than authoritarianism. So the Biden administration is couching this China relationship. Excuse me for that. That'll go off in a moment. I'll just turn it off. Uh, the, the Biden administration uh, is, is set, telling the American people that this is a I'm sorry about that ringing. Call from that should turn it off. Is telling the uh, uh, the uh, American people, couching it as a clash of systems, as a you know, it's not just uh, a competition over this interest or that interest or who who's going to. Very sorry about that interrupt. I don't know why it did what it did. Uh, to present it as a clash of values, a broad clash of economic systems, of political systems, of uh, uh, approaches to the liberal international order and so forth, and that we have to compete in, in the economy and in technology. We cannot, you know, the Biden administration uh, articulates the view that the United States has has declined in many ways, uh, and that it needs to pick itself up and 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 get back in the game. In some way, the Biden administration is conveniently using the challenge of China to sell its domestic progressive domestic policies. Uh, it's kind of like when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik back in the day, and then President Kennedy came along and said, we've got to compete, the so-called Sputnik moment. So there's a sense in which the China threat, if I can use that term, is a convenient uh, thing for influencing domestic policy. But it's not only that. It is really, actually is a strategy for competing with China. The second element of the Biden China policy, which is very different from that of Trump, is to, is to build on our alliances. So the United States has a, a, the biggest alliance system of any country in history. We have about 60 treaty allies around the world. There are the NATO allies we have, I've mentioned already, our alliances in Asia with Japan, Korea, Australia. Um, and we have other alliances uh, around the world. And then we also have quite a few countries that cooperate with us in a friendly way that are not formal allies. Taiwan could be an example of that, Vietnam, India. And some of our allies are not very helpful like Pakistan, but in general, we have a large alliance system, which is a power multiplier potentially. And especially when you're dealing with a rising power like China, the extent to which you can find common interest with allies, uh, it, it uh, sends a signal to China that China needs to be careful in it when it confronts the United States because it can find itself confronting other countries at the same time. Now, the al alliances are not a, a, go a sort of magic bullet for solving the US-China strategic competition because we never, in any alliance in history, really, uh, the allies are never 100% sharing the same interests. And when you look at the US alliance system, it's very complicated. We share some interests with some allies, but we, there's no ally that's going to 100% uh, 
throw itself into whatever game the United States wants to play. You take the example of Japan, for example. Japan is very, very ad adverse to a rising China threat. It's very sensitive to the rising China threat, but it doesn't want to have a war over Taiwan, for example, because Japan is very close to China. It's smaller, more vulnerable as an island nation, has the number two economy in the world, has something called the peace constitution, which has prevented Japan politically from building up a really big military. In short, the, 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 Ameri the United States can afford to be more confrontational with China than Japan wants to be. So I'm giving this as an example of the lack of complete overlap of interests between the United States and, and an, ally, an important ally, probably the most important ally that we have in the world. Another good example would be our relationship with Germany. Germany is a very, very important ally and the sort of core uh, member of the European Union, but it doesn't have any military interest in the East Asian uh, strategic sphere. It doesn't have any uh, military commitment to Taiwan or to Japan or to our allies in that region. It, uh, its interest in China is very, very heavily economic and commercial. So it is averse to economic disruption and the relationship between China and the West. And I could go on with other examples, but the point is that working with allies is a very valuable asset in confronting China, but it is not 100% because each ally has different interests from the United States and overlaps with the United States in some section of mutual interest. So it's important, but it's, it's not uh, the whole answer. The third thing that the Biden administration has brought in that's very different from the Trump administration is a consistent and high level emphasis on human rights. So in the Trump administration, there was some discussion of human rights by some members of the administration, particularly by Pompeo and Pence, those who were, I would say, within the Trump administration, those who were most antagonistic to China. But the, the Pompeo and Pence human rights agenda was focused on two issues, really religious freedom, and then on just the issue of the Western cultural values versus Eastern cultural values, which I think is a, a kind of dangerous concept because it's an you know, overgeneralization and kind of stereotyping. It is true that China does suppress uh, religious freedom, very, very true. Uh, this is a complicated story, but there are a lot of independent Christian communities in China that the government doesn't allow. They only allow Christian uh, worship under government controlled uh, denominations, one Protestant and one Catholic, but a lot of people don't want to be in the government controlled Christian denominations and they have independent what are called house churches. The Chinese government doesn't allow that, or local officials may allow it a little bit, but they will crack down on it from time to time. The government is also very antagonistic to Islam and considers it as a sign of terrorism. They're antagonistic to Tibetan Buddhism. They're antagonistic to certain homegrown um, uh, sects or practices such as the Falun Gong that you may have heard about. So religious freedom is a problem, but it isn't the only problem in China. There's also the crackdown on lawyers, on feminists, on dissidents of all kinds. Uh, there's the control of the internet. There's uh, control of media. There is the national security law crackdown that took place in Hong Kong. There's the internment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. There is even the Chinese effort, uh, somebody coined the term sharp power for this, the Chinese effort to control what is said about China overseas in the United States and Australia, Europe, and so forth by um, 
punishing journalists by denying visas to academics, by buying up Chinese language media around the world and so on, sort of influence attempts around, around the world. So the Biden administration has confronted the whole range of Chinese human rights violations and is using that as part of its China strategy. I think there are several different reasons why the Biden administration is doing this. Some of the reasons are strategic. That is to say that if, if we're in a strategic competition and part of that competition is to show the advantages of the Western or the American model versus the Chinese model, then human rights violations are kind of a weak spot of China. They're also to some extent a weak spot of the United States, right? We have quite a few human rights issues of our own, especially around the issue of race. But, uh, and the Chinese will, will criticize us publicly for these issues as well. So there's, there's a kind of strategic uh, um, fighting match that goes on in the international system among different countries around human rights, and it's part of the strategic competition. But I think as well, from what I know, uh, and I know a number of the people inside the Biden administration, these are people who actually do believe in human rights as an international norm and care about it. And that's been true in most American administrations, even in the Trump administration and the working level. I don't think Trump, he said he didn't care. He said, it's okay if Xi Jinping cracks down in Xinjiang, for example. But, um, but most officials in the State Department over many, many years, these are people who would always answer a phone call or an email and try to do what they could for some human rights uh, victim in China because they simply believe in it. Human rights is also valuable to the United States because it's something on which all of our allies agree. That's one of the things that all of the allies agree on in principle. They may not all wanna be out in front challenging China on this issue, but it's a, it's a point of liaison between us and other allies. And it is also something that tends to make sense to the American public. When you wanna tell the American public that we need to invest in overseas you know, military and overseas aid in order to compete with China and many in the American public would be wondering why is that important? Human rights is something that makes sense to many, uh, many Americans. A fourth element of the, China, of the Biden China policy that's, that's different from the Trump China policy is that the Biden government has invested a considerable amount of effort in seeking for areas of cooperation with China at the same time as they want to compete with China. So they have, a, it's a difficult and sort of sophisticated idea that is a little bit hard to sell and hard to implement that we can both compete and try to constrain Chinese behavior that we don't approve of, while at the same time, we can look for areas of cooperation with this other country. Um, this is of increasing urgency. When you compare, for example, the current period with the old Cold War period, and some have called the current period a new Cold War. But if you think about the old Cold War between the United States and, and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies, there was a very, very little effort to cooperate except in the area of arms control, control of nuclear weapons where there was significant negotiation and cooperation. But today we're in a different world because number one, we're faced with climate change. So in the area of climate change, cooperation is, is absolutely mandatory, no matter how much conflict you have with the other guy, because if the United States and China do not both simultaneously confront climate change, if just one of them confronts climate change, then the climate is going to change disastrously. They have to both do it in order to uh, solve the problem that each of them desperately wants that problem to be solved. The other area which I would 
categorized also as mandatory for cooperation is global public health. Again, we're in a different world in a sense in which pandemics and other health problems are more mobile than they ever were before because of the ramping up of global travel and global trade and global interdependence. And then there are areas of cooperation which I wouldn't describe as mandatory, but which are very appealing between China and the United States, such as in the area of dealing with North Korea, solving the Iran problem, uh, possibly with respect to infrastructure development and, and aid in, in developing countries, norms of global trade that would be to the benefit of both sides and so on and so forth. But we have to cooperate at least with respect to climate and public global public health. But cooperation is very, very difficult because you know it's easy for me as a professor to say that, you know, from a sort of strategic vision, we need this. But if you get into the room and negotiate with the other side, there immediately get to be all kinds of problems. Who, which side is going to bear the cost? Which side is going to provide what information to the other side? Which side is going to get the benefit? So for example, with climate change, to manage climate change, we need all kinds of new technologies. Whoever controls those new technologies is going to make a lot of money and have a lot of influence. Should it be us? Should it be China? How do we how do we help? Let's say we have a great technology. Do we share it with the Chinese or do we keep it so that we can make more money out of it? There was already a huge struggle over solar panels in which the United States and Germany and China were and South Korea were competing to get this market, which is more and more important in the 21st century. And basically, China got a hold of that market. They aren't the only solar panels, but they sell the largest number of solar panels. Another very important area for cooperation is cyber. We all need cyber security. If we don't have cyber security, another government or just a gang of criminals can shut down my water, my electric, my internet, turn off the growing number of autonomous vehicles, the traffic lights and so forth and banking system and create chaos. We all need an answer to this. But again, who's going to win? Who's going to build the equipment? Who's going to write the software? Are you going to share that software with somebody else? So it's cooperation is a very important element of China's strategy, but it's not an easy one. Um, let me go to the question of Taiwan then. So up until this point in my remarks, I've given a sort of guardedly pessimistic and guardedly optimistic, a guardedly pess optimistic, if you will, picture of the Biden, uh, US-China relationship under Biden and Xi Jinping. It is not a 100% confrontation. It is not fated to develop into World War III. It is uh, good for American comp competitiveness because it's spurring us on to be better. It is in some ways playing to the strength of the United States and our values, which remain more attractive around the world, although not to everybody, but I would say in general, more attractive around the world than Xi Jinping's authoritarian and rights abusing model. Uh, it's a relationship with elements of cooperation. And the thing I might add to that is that the, I consider the Chinese leadership to be very smart and very rational. You know, So they're not, any leadership can make bad mistakes and the Chinese leadership has made some mistakes, but if they see the US teaming up with its allies and, and, and presenting a, a, a strong, uh, uh, advocacy for the liberal international order and for stability in international affairs, the Chinese won't try to break that if they don't think they can win it. So the fact that you're dealing with, you're not dealing with, uh, in my opinion, with a sort of Adolf Hitler with, with megalomaniacal dreams who, who can tear down the house around his ears, but you're dealing with leaders who were ambitious but careful, that is encouraging. <clears throat> 
However, in the context of what is, you know, a fairly hopeful picture that, again, to nuance this, I'm thinking that we're facing decades of tension and stress, but not catastrophe. Um, in that context, there are some very, a small number of very, very dangerous uh, foci of conflict. And the number one of those actually is Taiwan. Uh, recently, the Council on Foreign Relations issued a really, really good report. You guys can look it up on the internet called The United States, China, and Taiwan, A Strategy to Prevent War by Ambassador Robert Blackwill and a scholar named Philip Zellico. Uh, and they said, and this is just the most, you know, this is no secret, but I'm just quoting them as an authority, that, that the Taiwan issue is the most dangerous issue in the world today in terms of the potential to spark a war between China and the United States that would also draw in other powers, in particular Japan, and could escalate. And China is a nuclear power. Such a war could escalate, and there one can hardly say what would be the outer limit of the damage that might be done by a war between China and the United States over Taiwan. Why over Taiwan? So this is a subject on which many Americans and many people around the world do not understand why there has to be so much tension over this particular issue. Um, some people say, why does China insist upon getting control over Taiwan? The Taiwanese people don't want that. Why doesn't China just let them alone? It's a different island. It's off the shore of China. The, China. the Taiwanese people are happy the way they are. Why doesn't China just let Taiwan be Taiwan? What is the stake of it for China? The answer to that is, however, that if you are the Chinese government, you absolutely need eventually, sooner or later, to control Taiwan, number one, if you're going to establish the security of your own territory on the mainland, because Taiwan is a large island 100 miles off the coast of the mainland of China that has, that is, uh, has been used by the United States as, uh, uh, as a base from which to threaten China militarily. It has been used by Japan in the 19th century and early part of the 20th century as a base from which to threaten China militarily. It is also part of what's called the first island chain, which is a chain of islands that makes it difficult for the Chinese Navy freely to, to enter and exit from Chinese ports and go out into the Pacific, wider Pacific Ocean because other powers, whether it's the Philippines, Japan, Taiwan, uh, are, are, are con Indonesia are controlling these entry and exit points from the Taiwan Strait and from the East China Sea and the South China Sea. So it has military strategic importance. It also has technological importance because Taiwan is an advanced manufacturer of cyber chips, of high-end chips that China itself is not yet able to manufacture. It is also a political threat to the mainland because it's a thriving democracy. And from an international law point of view, it actually is Chinese territory. Even the regime, the government in Taiwan constitutionally calls itself the Republic of China and recognizes in, in legal fiction only that Taiwan is a part of China, much as they don't wanna be part of China, but that's their inherited constitution that they haven't changed. And the United States recognizes uh, the Chinese claim that Taiwan is a part of China. So from an international law point of view, the Chinese position is we need Taiwan, we want Taiwan, and we, and we have a legal right to Taiwan. And if we don't control Taiwan, that's not satisfactory. So then the question is, why does the United States not 
just back off from this problem. The United States is involved in the Taiwan problem because it uh, has uh, ex expressed through a number of uh, official documents that it insists upon what we call the peaceful resolution of the Taiwan issue. And peaceful resolution could have meant originally that the Taiwanese and the mainland Chinese would negotiate some kind of outcome that would satisfy both sides. But as time has gone by, the Taiwanese have increasingly decided they don't want to be part of mainland China. And the recent events in Hong Kong have only spurred them to a, a stronger consensus that they don't want to be part of the People's Republic of China. So now peaceful resolution means the uh, uh, ongoing and perhaps infinite separation of Taiwan from mainland China. But does the United States have to stick to that commitment? It, there's a debate over that in US policy circles, but I think the, the view of the government, and I share that view of the American government is that if the United States didn't honor its commitment to peaceful resolution, that is to the voluntary will of the people of Taiwan, our whole alliance system would just collapse, that the allies see this as a sign of American resolution and capability. Um, and, uh, uh, and if we were to back off from it, the Japanese would say, we can't trust the Americans. The NATO allies would say, we can't trust the Americans. And our position in the world would dr drastically uh, diminish. So both sides have, I think, a non-negotiable interest in their position in the Taiwan issue. When you face that kind of situation in international affairs, then you got the both sides building up their military. And that's what China has done. They've built up a military capacity that the American Pentagon calls anti-access area denial a capability basically in a word to sink US aircraft carriers. Of course, they haven't done it. We don't know if it would work, but the Pentagon thinks they have that capability. Uh, and so the American deterrence posture around Taiwan has been based on aircraft carriers and on large uh, uh, Air Force Navy bases like Guam, Okinawa, Yokosuka, which are also now vulnerable to Chinese missiles. So you have a shifting power balance, military balance in which American deterrence against China has deteriorated, which creates a dangerous situation for war. The current uh, commander of the American Indo-Pacific Command based in Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, Admiral Robertson has recently been testifying on, on Capitol Hill or through Zoom that he thinks the Chinese see this as an in, a window of American weakness and they're likely to launch an attack within the next, he says, six years. I don't share that. I'm not, a, of course, I'm not a military strategist that I don't have a, a, a security clearance. But I and quite a few other people don't don't necessarily share that exact prediction, but we do think that the United States needs to readjust its deterrence posture in the uh, Taiwan region if it's going to continue to keep the peace by deterring a Chinese a military move on Taiwan. And here I would refer you again to this new paper by Blackwill and Zelico published by the Council on Foreign Relations where they discuss this in great detail and give their uh, suggestion and other people have other ideas about how the United States should deal with we, we adjust it to deal with that problem. So I have, I think, used up all the time that was allocated to me for this talk and I'll just make my, my conclusion uh, by saying that, um, that reiterating that this uh, relationship with China is the most important challenge, I think that the young people listening to this talk are gonna be facing probably throughout your careers as citizens. And you have a tremendous stake in 
American policies that handle the Chinese uh, challenge, if you will, in a way that doesn't exaggerate the challenge, doesn't provoke uh, war with China, but which competes effectively, makes America strong, and deters uh, Chinese moves that challenge fundamental American interests, including our fundamental interest in Taiwan. So let me end it there and uh, look forward to some discussion and questions and answers and comments from folks who are listening to the talk. Yes. Um, so um, we have um, um, Eric Chi as one to um, collect all the questions uh, from audience and then convey to Professor uh, Nathan. Um, Eric uh, is currently uh, our MA student uh, in public policy, and he was a, a graduate from uh, political science uh, justice, um, I think last June. This is his first year as an MPP student and a wonderful student. Um, and um, he um, graduated with a double major in econ and political science with um, an earned a summa. And also he um, uh, was um, the um, last year's 2019 um, outstanding senior. And uh, I think it's in 20, uh, 2020 uh, outstanding senior. And also he joined the um, most pre prestigious um, honor society for undergraduate, which is uh, Phi Kappa uh, Beta, I think. So, um, Eric, you now have the uh, uh, power <laughs> to collect all the questions and let Professor Nason know. Uh, so I think we, yeah, there's a lot of questions coming in. So please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so first we have a question from uh, Dr. Yip and she's asking how important is the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy in, in foreign relations in China? Right, so Wolf Warrior, so I mentioned that when Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, China began to unfold a more assertive foreign policy. And part of that has been behavior by Chinese diplomats overseas in missions, you know, in Britain and Sweden and so on, and, and uh, uh, in embassies called Wolf Warrior. So Wolf Warrior is a movie in China that uh, it's a sort of an action movie in which a Chinese hero actually rescues um, some uh, Chinese uh, people who are being attacked by, I haven't seen the movie, but I've read about it. You know, uh, it's a Ch China superhero, not superhero, but it's China hero movie and carrying the, uh, there are two of these movies, Wolf Warrior and then Wolf Warrior 2. Uh, so, so that's where the term wolf warrior comes from. But in the Chinese embassies now, the embassy officials, whenever China gets criticized, often on human rights issues in some foreign country, the Chinese embassy will come out with a very undiplomatic statement, you know, uh, you're another or don't, don't you dare say that about us kind of a thing. And there are a number, particularly the foreign ministry spokesperson, Zhao Li Jian, who, who gives press briefings in, in Beijing at the foreign ministry has been, you know, give as good as you get kind of thing and fight back. And this has added to, I, I believe that this has been one of the, I said before that the Xi Jinping government is pretty rational and careful, but this is an area where I think they've made a mistake um, they have let, I can imagine that the diplomats in the embassies think that they need to show their loyalty and their toughness because that's what's coming out of, of the top leadership. 
but it has had a very negative effect on public opinion around the world, especially in Europe and Australia and in these kind of Western liberal type countries, had a negative effect and has driven down the popularity of China in a lot of the world and has helped, is helpful to the Biden administration in building up these alliances. So it is an important phenomenon in the total picture. Yeah. So we also have two questions in the, uh, from the audience talking about human rights. And um, one of the audience members is asking, why isn't there more cooperation with U, uh, US uh, and its allies against China when there are so many human rights abuses? Um, but also there's a question regarding um, the United States and its um, care uh, and care and concern for human rights. Um, because as the um, audience member says, the US doesn't care about human rights in Palestine, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and other countries. Right. Well, first of all, in a certain sense, the answer to both of these questions is the same, which is that governments uh, are <clears throat> largely driven by interest, by you know, national interest as they calculate it. So when it comes to cooperation on human rights, there is some. Uh, some cooperation, but each government has to decide for itself the cost benefit analysis of attacking China or Russia or anybody else on this, that, or the other human rights issue. And a country, say, like Germany, as I said before, has a very strong commercial interest in China. Australia is a country whose main exports go to China and it's extremely vulnerable to Chinese economic pressure. Japan is a country which has, which has a very uh, uh, diffident or shy type of foreign policy because of its history and the, the suspicion toward Japan. <laughs> there goes that stupid phone again. Um, uh, so, so they all have their own reasons for being more cautious than the United States on human rights issues. You think about the Muslim countries in the world and why don't they criticize China on, uh, on the issue of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang? And it's because those countries uh, don't want to get caught in uh, U.S., as the second question indicates, they don't consider the United States a very, very friendly country to them either, you know, and so they, they don't like China, they don't like the United States, they don't want to get caught into that battle, and they, they would kind of prefer to use China as a counterweight against the United States. Turkey, for example, would like to use its relationship with China as a counterweight against EU and American pressure. So each country is looking at the details and cooperating when they when they want to. So for example, Merkel, Angela Merkel in Germany has done some wonderful things on human rights with respect, for example, to getting Ai Weiwei, the artist, out of China, getting Liu Xia, the wife of Liu Xiaobo, out of China, and then giving asylum to these people. Uh, but she doesn't go along with the entire US agenda on human rights. And so one could tick down the list. And then I agree with the questioner who says that the United States is inconsistent in its human rights policy. And not only is it inconsistent in its human rights policy toward Palestine and Egypt and so forth, but in our domestic politics, as I mentioned, our own human rights record is very, um, very marred even though in a different way from the Chinese human rights record especially by the issues of racism, uh, several issues, issues of racism against African-American, uh, against Asian-American. Uh, so, you know, we have a bunch of issues connected to racism. And uh, 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 so anyway, without going into the, all the problems that one could list with human rights in the United States, but talking about say Egypt, Egypt is an important, security partner of the United States. Uh, we, we support the Egyptian military. So if you're a policymaker, you want to think about 
I want to criticize Egypt, but I don't want to destroy that re relationship. Now, if you and I were in the government, we might make that calculation a little bit different. I would probably be a, in the 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 uh, Department of Human of Rights, DRL, the Department of Democracy, Rights, and Labor in the State Department, and I would go to meetings and say we have to be more consistent. But the other guy at the meeting is going to say we can't afford to say those things. So that's how it gets sort of battled out in the policy process. And again, with Palestine, <clears throat> it's because Israel is our most important, you know, so it's a cynical reason, it's national interest. I, I, I acknowledge that. It's always been true with human rights policy that it's inconsistent. In the case of China, it's been inconsistent as well because various presidents, let's say George W. Bush, for example, felt that it wasn't in his interest to confront China publicly on human rights. He did it privately. Uh, so you have to decide, and in, it seems to be in the interest of the Biden administration to do it much more consistently toward China. Yeah, that's a long, yeah, sorry, a very long answer to the question. Uh, this next question is also from the audience, and I think it's getting at the um, Biden administration's cooperation with competition um, kind of thing with China. And he's asking, what is China's long-term interest in America? Uh, is the view also strategic competition? Uh huh. Okay, so this is a great question because we really don't know what, well, you know, when you say long-term, then you're bringing in something that's very difficult because the long-term is very, you know, very long. Uh, and and the Chinese, you know, the United. You can look around in policy documents from the United States and get some understanding of long-term strategy, which is we want to prevent the rise of any peer competitor. We want to keep the international system stable, and so on and so forth. Um, it's kind of a conservative vision because, you know, we are the beneficiary of the current international system. China is not satisfied with the current setup. Partly they're not satisfied with this ring of American power that I described around them, military and political power. Partly they're not satisfied with American dominance of leading technologies. Partly they're not satisfied with American dominance of <clears throat> major international institutions and norms like the international trading system and so on in the World Bank. So there's a lot of things with which they're not satisfied, but is their long-term vision one in which, <clears throat> let's take the worst case scenario that the United States economy staggers and, 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 and sort of stagnates and the Chinese economy keeps ripping and the Chinese economy becomes three times as large as the U.S. economy in, in you know, 2050 or something like that. What would China do then? Would they invade the United States, for example? And I think the answer to that is definitely no. Why would they do that? You know, that would be that would be a big mistake. But would they, uh, for example, find a way to break up the American alliances. For example, if they were to attack and win in Taiwan and then the Japanese, uh, the US, Japan and US European alliances kind of broke apart and then Japan has to decide what to do and India has to decide what to do and would China make itself the center of the world? Well, probably yes, in that scenario. Would China then want to like wreck the United Nations or get rid of international trade? No, I don't think so, because they benefit from those things. So in other words, I don't think China's a revolutionary power in the way that the Soviet Union was that had a whole different, every government should have communism and the whole international system should be totally different. China's not like that, but it could become much more powerful than the United States, and we would have to really live as a second-rate power in that case. I don't think we would disappear as a country, but uh, it would be a big blow. Uh, but we don't know because the Chinese don't say, and they may they themselves may not really know because they have to wait and see how things pan out. Uh, we also have some questions about the Belt and Road Initiative and economics in general. So about could you expand on the, yeah. 
okay, Belt yeah. and Road Initiative, yep. as well as how the U.S. has been competing with uh, with those economic initiatives and the benefits to South and East Asian countries with U.S. cooperation. So the Belt and Road Initiative, as I said, is uh, nobody quite knows because it doesn't have a sort of website with everything on it, but it seems to be about a trillion dollar investment in infrastructure, broadly understood roads, airports, ports, cyber infrastructure, railways, stadiums, uh, going along with training of officials and so on. Uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia, for sure, but also in Africa, Middle East, Latin America, Central Asia, very important, and, and Eastern Europe. So it's a huge thing. Um, it has, every, in every country where the Belt and Road Initiative operates, it has friends and enemies. So the friends are usually the government that says, oh yeah, I need that railway and I'm willing to borrow money from China and let China build it. And the enemies are like the opposition party that says, why are we borrowing so much money from China? How are we gonna pay it back? How come the Chinese are not hiring our local people but they're sending their own people and so forth. So it's, it's controversial in every country, but my own assessment is that you know basically, it is doing a very positive thing for China, which is to make China a major presence in all of these 80 countries and to, in various ways to sort of tie up those countries' economies with the Chinese economy in a way that contributes to Chinese prosperity. Now, the United States wakes up to the fact that you have this Belt and Road Initiative and has so far not competed effectively with it because we didn't have the federal money uh, to do this. So the Trump administration articulated a program, and I forget the name of this program, but it was a hundred, I think a hundred million dollar program that was mostly public private investment, you know, where the federal government had a, a guarantee and they wanted private investment to come in, which is a no, it's no good because $100 million is not enough. And private investment, if it wants to go into someplace, it's going to go. It doesn't need the government. Uh, you know, these projects are not necessarily going to be profitable. They're risky anyway, at least. And so if so, Western private enterprise wasn't doing it, and that's the gap that Chinese, the Chinese program was filling. So far, the Biden administration hasn't really come up with a good answer to this Belt and Road Initiative. And I think part of the strategic competition is that it needs a policy that's more plausible. Part of the Belt and Road Initiative is the Huawei construction of 5G infrastructure in so many countries. And this is very, very important because whoever builds most of the 5G is going to A, set the 5G standards, which will require people to continue to purchase equipment from that supplier and not from the United States, and B, is going to have the ability to spy on, you know, all around the world very easily through the infrastructure that they build. So we don't have a good answer to that yet. This is an area where China has um, done something very smart, in my opinion. Uh, so these next two questions from the audience are somewhat related, but I'm trying to present them as one unified thing. Um, um, Jonathan is asking, to what extent does the Chinese populace buy in and support Chinese foreign policy objectives? And Tim is asking, why does China treat Hong Kong with a heavy hand when Taiwan is looking on? Uh, yeah, great, great. Um, <clears throat> There are lots of surveys, research done in China by very reliable scholars based in the West. I belong myself to a project called the Asian Barometer Survey that has so far done five waves of surveys in China, and we're going to do a sixth, that all show the same thing, which is that the Chinese public is very supportive of the Chinese regime in general. Now. Uh, that kind of contradicts sort of top of the head American political science theory that says that governments that are authoritarian should meet resistance from the population. But the fact is that the Chinese government is very popular. I've written an article, you guys can look it up or I could email it over to you and you could send it to whoever is interested in, in a journal called the Journal of Democracy 
called the, my article is called The Puzzle of Authoritarian Legitimacy about this problem, but it isn't only me. I mean, a lot of scholars have found this popularity. There are a lot of reasons for it. The Chinese government controls propaganda. The Chinese government has raised people's living standards and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of reasons that we can explain the high level of public support for the Chinese government. Now, when you ask about that with respect to foreign policy in particular, Chinese people pretty much know about Chinese foreign policy, what the government tells them. And it's a heroic narrative and not entirely fake. I mean, you know, a lot of it is true. China has stood up. China has become you know, move from being the sick man of Asia to being, you know, the number two power, a major power, a peer competitor of the United States. These are tremendous successes. And I think that many Chinese people are just tremendously proud of that. And so there's support for foreign policy as well. But as in the United States, Chinese people don't know that much in details about Chinese foreign policy. With respect to Hong Kong, opinion in Hong Kong when Hong Kong came un, ceased, ceased to be a British colony and returned to Chinese control in 1997, at that time, most of the population of Hong Kong was kind of non-political. Uh, they were just in business and they didn't care. But as time has gone by, the younger people in Hong Kong have increasingly forged something they call Hong Kong identity that is very separate and even antagonistic or rejecting of PRC or mainland China identity. It's based around the idea that Hong Kong is a wonderful, used to be a wonderful play, place where you were free, where you could say what you wanted. People had come there from mainland China and breathed the air of freedom. Um, they, uh, um, they had an annual vigil on to, to, to protest against the 1989 crackdown in Tiananmen Square against the students who were hunger striking there and so forth. And they were moving forward. That youth movement had had a number of huge demonstrations that the Hong Kong government was unable to control. And the pro so-called pro-democracy camp in Hong Kong was building up to win and enough in, in, in the next election, win enough seats in the legislative council to really challenge the Hong Kong administration, which is, which is loyal to Beijing. So the situation in Hong Kong was getting worse and worse. And Beijing made a calculation that the local authorities couldn't control it and it would just get more out of control. So that's why they moved in. And your questioner is right that they paid a huge price in terms of public opinion, not only in Taiwan, especially in Taiwan, but all, all around the so-called Western world. You know, everybody saw what they did and everybody considered, everybody, you know, the, the, the liberal democracies and citizens in the West considered what China did there to be very, you know, vicious. So it has, it has taken a cut again, like wolf warrior, wolf warrior diplomacy, this action in Hong Kong has really hurt the image of China in the in a large part of the outside world. Uh, so we have more questions on the Belt and Road, specifically mm -hmm. about the debt trap, whether it is fiction or um, fact. Yeah. And also how that relates to the uh, publicly owned National Bank of China and whether or not it gives the Chinese an advantage in those kinds of uh, financial projects. Yes. Um, there's one case where it clearly was a debt trap, and that is the port of Hanbon Tota in Sri Lanka. So at that time, the Sri Lanka regime had a president named Raja Paksa. They do again now, that's the brother. But at that time, the, there were, the guy who was the president um, did a deal with China to build this very big port in his own home electoral district on the southwest coast of Sri Lanka, even though Sri Lanka didn't really need another port, also an international airport there built by China. They didn't need it. It wasn't economically viable. They had a 
enough port facilities in the capital of Colombo. And so this port didn't make money and it didn't pay back its loans. One of, one of the uh, features of the Belt and Road Initiative is that China usually doesn't give money, it loans money. And, and not at a World Bank rate usually, but at a, some kind of commercial rate, which nowadays in the world is not very high, but it's a commercial rate. So Hanbun Tota did not make money and it was not paying back its loan. And to, to square that away, the Sri Lankan government signed a 99 year lease with a st Chinese state owned company that basically gave that state owned company kind of ownership or colonial ownership over over the port of Hanbun Tota. So that was a debt, to call it a debt trap is to say that the Chinese constructed it intentionally. And I don't know whether that's the case, but that was the great, great case of the debt trap. The Trump administration, Pompeo in particular, went around the world saying, don't take Chinese money because it's gonna be a debt trap. But it isn't clear that any of the other Belt and Road projects of which there are hundreds is a debt trap. Uh, and the argument that don't take Chinese money because it's a debt trap is not a very strong argument because the, the uh, you know, he, Pompeo went to Africa. He said, don't take Chinese money. And they said, okay, you give me money. And Pompeo said, we don't have money. If there's only one source of money and you want, you know, a either you're a corrupt leader and you want a big project for that, or you're a good leader and you want a railroad or a port for the benefit of your country. Either way, you want money. The US hasn't got it, the Chinese have it. The these are the Chinese terms, you, you take it. You know, so, but, but, but I don't think that, that, you know, so the debt trap is a talking point of Pompeo more so than an, a reality that we can prove in a lot of cases. There's one true case. Chinese banks <clears throat> are state-owned. There's a bunch of big banks. The ones that are most active in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative are uh, the Chinese uh, Development Bank. That's not the exact name, but I'm just blanking the exact name. And the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is actually multinational. It's not only China. And then there are other big state banks. So I'm not quite sure uh, what the questioner wanted to have said about it, but, but yes, the Chinese state banks play a, a dominant role in financing the Belt and Road Initiative, it's true. Uh, so there's just three more questions here uh, from the audience. And one of them, the first one says, uh, do you believe the current situation in China with the Uyghurs could escalate what what does the questioner mean by escalate? You mean whether the, they would escalate the conflict with the United? Let me say two things about that uh, to interpret the question. Um, I don't think that the Chinese leaders are seeking to escalate. I think to, to you know to pr provoke or escalate conflict with the United States. I think instead they're looking for opportunities. I think they saw the Trump administration as an opportunity to. To, to do certain things like, and even the, and the Obama administration as well, they perceived both Obama as weak and Trump as, you know, sort of flaky so that, uh, uh, and manipulable. So it was during the Obama administration that they built these sand islands in the South China Sea, but they did it in a way, I don't have time to ex sort of describe it, but they did it in a way that was very smart so that it didn't, didn't escalate. They did something that the U.S. hated, but it didn't wasn't escalatory. They weren't looking to trigger a fight. They were looking exactly to take advantage of what they perceived as American weakness in a way that they could get away with something without escalating. Um, with re but with respect to uh, and and so in the Taiwan scenario, I think they will also try to assess when is it a good moment when the United States is weaker or distracted and when they think that the US will not risk an aircraft carrier with its 7,000 crew members being sunk to defend Taiwan. So they're gonna to listen to the American discourse in Washington. They're gonna 
do what they can to understand American military operations. And if they see a chance, and they might make a mistake here, but if they think they see a chance, then they uh, might uh, then they might escalate. But not because they're looking for a, a fight. They're looking to, as the famous Chinese military strategist Sunza said, to win without fighting. And the other interpretation of that question could have something to do with Chinese domestic politics because Xi Jinping has consolidated his power so tightly that he must have a lot of opposition inside of the Chinese Communist Party from other leaders who are jealous. But we don't see that opposition because, uh, you know, precisely because he has consolidated so much power that nobody dares to challenge him openly. And he has removed term limits from his position in these three top posts that I mentioned, president and secretary, general secretary and chairman of the military commission. So he's in power till he decides to step down, maybe for life, maybe for a third term. We don't know what he's going to do. But that kind of situation does create the potential for a succession crisis at some point. Say he you know, gets sick or you know, uh, it doesn't pay attention. You know, there can be a coup. There can be a crisis over succession. So in that, the, the sort of escalation of the domestic political crisis, which we don't see now, which is sort of an invisible crisis, that is a possibility. Yeah. And what uh, did you? Was there a second question? Because now I've lost it. I think that was it for that one. They okay. specified that it was um, escalating conflict between the US and China. I see, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess I answered that in the first part of my answer. Um, this next uh, audience member asks, do you think that we should be exerting more commercial slash political pressure on China, uh, limiting outsourcing and moving to limit trade reliance on China? So I suppose. Um, yes, in certain areas. So I think that we do have to bring back, I mean, this is not um, an original idea of mine. I think it's pretty broad consensus in the policy community that we need to be self-reliant or sufficiently self-reliant in strategic manufacturing. That is going to be advanced chips. It's going to be certain pharmaceutical precursors, you know, the chemicals that go into pharmaceuticals, some things that are very simple, uh, personal protective equipment and stuff. We cannot be reliant on any import source for certain things that are, that, that are necessary for national security, even if it's more expensive to produce those things here in the United States. So that, I think that part of it is true. I think in terms of putting pressure on China to change China, which was the strategy within the Trump White House, particularly of Robert Lighthizer, the trade, the chief trade negotiator, the Chinese are not going to change their economic system because of pressure from us. The, the American market is valuable to China, but it's not existentially valuable. It's not so valuable that they will uh, change direction for us. They have a lot of other markets. First of all, their domestic consumer market, and then many other markets all over the world, Europe, and every other country, Latin America, and so on. So uh, we, we just cannot use our trade power with China to make them give up anything that's important to them. And one thing that is important to them is their economic model. It works for them. I'm not saying that they'll never change it. I think it's under constant revision because of their own reasons, but not to please us. And so, no, I think trade pressure is, is basically in terms of, if I interpret trade pressure as, uh, as banning Chinese imports in order to force China to change, you know, to give us a so-called level playing field, that won't work. Political pressure, I think, is very valuable, and that includes the human rights, uh, um, you know, portfolio that that part of our policy, as well as linking up with the allies to you know 
reinforce to China our commitment to various international norms that we claim are legitimate and are important to us. I think those, those things are very important. I think that the Chinese need to understand what's our bottom line and what are we really prepared to defend and what matters to us. And you could label that kind of signaling as political pressure. Um, another thing that you could call political pressure would be American support for pro-democracy and pro-human rights activists inside of China and overseas. And I think that support's very valuable. It's, it's a moral obligation on our part. And I think it makes life complicated for the Chinese regime and keeps alive the seeds, the sparks of future change in China. The Chinese system will change, you know, all systems change, the Chinese system will, will change and there are pressures for more uh, lib liberalism, not, not for China to adopt a US constitution kind of a thing, but for the Chinese government to be more accountable, to allow more freedom, to have a more authentic kind of rule of law. There are internal pressures for that and it's helpful for us to support those when we can who are pushing in that direction. This question is asking, uh, is China, China likely to join with Russia as a united front or are they more likely to go it alone? Well, they are cooperating a lot. As, as, as with everything that I've discussed here, when it comes to international affairs, countries can cooperate, but they never have identical interests. And in the case of China and Russia, the big, I, the big overlapping interest is that both of them fear American pressure and want to push back against American pressure. And both of them want to weaken the American posture in the world. But their, their interests are in different geographical areas, obviously. China is in East Asia. Russia's interests are predominantly oriented toward, toward its, its Western border, you know, toward Ukraine, toward Germany, and so forth. And China doesn't really have any interest in Russia seizing, for example, Crimea. You know, I mean, China basically is against countries invading the sovereignty of other countries because if it allowed for that, somebody might invade China. So China's against that kind of a thing. They don't, they don't criticize Russia because they're working on cooperation with Russia. Uh, the Russians really don't have any interest in the Taiwan issue, for example. So there's a lot of areas where the two sides, you know, tolerate each other, but they're not going to become blood brothers. They're not going to have restore the alliance that they used to have, but they cooperate in a lot of areas. They also have conflicts. The Russians are extremely suspicious of Chinese uh, immigration into the Russian Far East which is thinly populated while China, of course, as you know, has a very dense population. They have big struggles over the price of Russian oil and gas that Russia supplies to China. So they also uh, <clears throat> have a rivalry over which of them is most influential over the Central Asian countries that used to be parts of the Soviet Union. So it's, a, it's an important, from an American point of view, China-Russia cooperation is a a, you know, a bad thing, and it's important, but we shouldn't exaggerate its potential. Um, this uh, audience member asks, what are the implications for the Chinese birth rate falling to the lowest levels in seven decades? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to inject that this is going to be the last question. Uh okay. Yeah, well, that's another great question because the, uh, China is one of the countries, not the only one. Others include Japan um, and some of the other Asian countries where the, the, the birth rate is not the population replacement rate. And as when you have that kind of a phenomenon, you have uh, the ratio between retired people older people who are retired and not working and who are living on pensions and the working people who are productive, that ratio changes and you begin to have more uh, retired people. And I read uh, just, I'm not a great one for the demographic numbers, but I think I read that by some 
year in the pretty near future that it was a 20% of the Chinese population would be on pensions. And so this drags the economy. It's bad for the economy. The Indian population is growing. The American population traditionally has been growing uh, with an important boost from immigrants. So we need to keep, you know, restore immigration because that's a source of demographic vitality and health in our economy. Um, so the questioner asks, what is the implication? So one implication is this, the drag on the economy. Now, a lot of things influence the Chinese economy. So we can't say that this one factor is gonna take X percent off of the growth rate of the Chinese economy. It's too complicated to say that, but it's a drag. Um, another feature that's in there is the sex ratio because there are more, uh, uh, boys than girls, be, uh, and this is a, a legacy of the population planning program where girl babies were uh, kind of disappeared for various reasons. They were aborted or different things happened to them that are too uh, disturbing to mention probably. And so you have a, an excess of men and nobody knows how that's going to be handled. Some countries import brides, you know, you could import brides from, from other Asian countries like Vietnam or Korea, <clears throat> there's some of that. But I, I've never seen any policy statement from the Chinese government about how they're going to solve the sex ratio problem either. So we don't know. Yeah, so that would be my answer to that question. Thank you, Eric, for uh, pitching the questions. You're on mute, I think, are you? Yeah. So we're yeah. ending this Q&A uh, section and um, thank you so much, Professor Nathan, Andy, <laughs> for this um, very timely uh, lecture and uh, all the answers you have given to our audience. It is really very exciting for us to have you today. So let's bring, um, uh, can we bring all the uh, um, panelists in um, so that we can talk to Professor Nason? Okay, so um, go ahead, people. Oh, I would really like to um, express my gratitude to this extremely enlightening talk. I particularly enjoyed the Q&A section. It went really great. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. I, I enjoyed being here. On yeah. Zoom. Yeah. Um, Oregon is getting beautiful. Spring is really here. Mm -hmm. But yes, maybe next time we can bring you here to yeah. <laughs> enjoy our beautiful nature here. Uh, so What's, uh, I guess we cannot see the audience or this is totally different from the Zoom because this is a webinar, so we wouldn't know anything. But I'm so happy we had so many questions and uh, um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your uh, lecture. Uh, it's a great, uh, great for our college, for our students and for, uh, I sh I'm sure there's, some uh, professors attended this meeting, uh, some people who know you and ask me if they can interact with you. Uh, but I said, that's too bad because the, the setup does not allow that to happen. Yeah. Well, next time we can all get together. And have some good Oregon wine. We right. Have, <laughs> yes, have good wine in okay. Oregon. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.